slatternly woman flitted hither and thither in a hurry with coffee pots, plates of bread, and other appurtenances to supper. And these were said to be the wives of the angel, or some of them at least. And of course they were, for if they had been hired help, they would not have let an angel from above storm and swear at them as he did, let alone one from the place this one hailed from. This was our first experience of the Western peculiar institution, and it was not very prepossessing. We did not tarry long to observe it, but hurried on to the home of the Latter-day Saints, the stronghold of the prophets, the capital of the only absolute monarch in America, Great Salt Lake City. As the night closed in, we took sanctuary in the Salt Lake House and unpacked our baggage. Chapter 13, Mormons and Gentiles. Exhilarating drink and its effect on Bemis. Salt Lake City, a great contrast. A Mormon, a Mormon vagrant, talk with a saint. A visit to the king, a happy simile. We had a fine supper of the freshest meats and fowls and vegetables, a great variety and, and as great abundance. We walked about the streets some afterward and glanced in at shops and stores and there was fascination in surreptitiously staring at every creature we took to be a Mormon. This was fairyland to us, to all intents and purposes, a land of enchantment and goblins and awful mystery. We felt a curiosity to ask every child how many mothers it had and if it could tell them apart. And we, and we experienced a thrill every time a dwelling house door opened and shut as we passed, disclosing a glimpse of human heads and backs and shoulders, for we so longed to have a good, satisfying look at a Mormon family in, a, in all its comprehensive ampleness, disposed in the customary concentric rings of its home circle. By and by... By and by, the acting governor of the territory introduced us to other Gentiles, and we spent a sociable hour with them. Gentiles are people who are not Mormons. Our fellow passenger, Bemis, took care of himself during this part of the evening, and did not make an overpowering success of it either, for he came into our room in the hotel about 11 o'clock, full of cheerfulness and talking loosely, disjointedly and indiscriminately, and every now and then tugging out a ragged word by the roots that had more hiccups than syllables in it. <laughs> this, together with his hanging his coat on the floor on one side of a chair and his vest on the floor on the other side, and piling his pants on the floor just in front of the same chair, and then contemplating the general result with superstitious awe, and finally pronouncing it too many for him, and going to bed with his boots on, led us to fear that something had eaten that something he had eaten had not agreed with him. But we knew afterward that it was something he had been drinking. It was the exclusively Mormon refresher Valley Tan. Valley Tan, or at least one form of Valley Tan, is a kind of whiskey or first cousin of it. Uh, is of Mormon invention and manufactured only in Utah. Tradition says it is made of, imported, fire and brimstone. If I remember rightly, no public drinking saloons were allowed in the kingdom of Brigham Young, and no private drinking permitted among the faithful, except they confine themselves to Valley Tan. <clears throat> Next day, we strolled about everywhere through the broad, straight, level streets and enjoyed the pleasant strangeness of a city of 15,000 inhabitants, with no loafers perceptible in it and no visible drunkards or noisy people, 
a limpid stream rippling and dancing through every street in place of a filthy gutter. Block after block of trim dwellings built of frame and sunburned brick, a great thriving orchard and garden behind every one of them, apparently. Branches from the street stream winding and sparkling among the garden beds and fruit trees, and a grand general air of neatness, repair, thrift, and comfort around and about and over the whole. And everywhere were workshops, factories, and all manner of industries, and intent faces and busy hands were to be seen wherever one looked, and in one's ears was the ceaseless clink of hammers, the buzz of trade, and the, constant, and the contented hum of drums and flywheels. The armorial crest of my own state consisted of two desolate bears holding up the head of a dead and gone cask between them and making the pertinent remark, United we stand, divided we fall. It was always too figurative for the author of this book, but the Mormon crest was easy. And it was simple, unostentatious, and fitted like a glove. It was a representation of a golden beehive with the bees all at work. The city lies on the edge of a level plain as broad as the state of Connecticut and crouches close down to the ground under a curving weight of mighty mountains whose heads are hidden in the clouds and whose shoulders bear relics of the snows of winter all, all the summer long. Seen, seen from one of these dizzy heights, 12 or 15 miles off, Great Salt Lake City is toned down and diminished till it is suggestive of a child's toy village reposing under the majestic protection of the Chinese wall. On some of, these, of those mountains to the southwest, it had been raining every day for two weeks, but not a drop had fallen in the city and on hot days in late spring and early autumn, the citizens could quit fanning and growling and go out and cool off by looking at the luxury of a glorious snowstorm going on in the mountains. They could enjoy it at a distance at those seasons every day, though no snow would fall on their streets or anywhere near them. Salt Lake City was healthy, an extremely healthy city, they, de they declared there was only one physician in the place, and he was arrested every week regularly and held to answer under the Vagrant Act for having no visible means of support. They always give you a good substantial article of truth in Salt Lake, and good measure and good weight too. Very often if you wish to weigh one of their airiest little commonplace statements, you would want the hay scales. We desired to vis visit the famous Inland Sea, the American Dead Sea, the Great Salt Lake, 17 miles horseback from the city, for we had dreamed about it, and thought about it, and talked about it, and yearned to see it all the first part of our trip. And now, when it was only an arm's length away, it had suddenly lost nearly every bit of its interest. And so we put it off in a sort of general way till next day, and that was the last we ever thought of it. We dined with some hospitable Gentiles and visited the foundation of the prodigious temple and talked long with that shrewd Connecticut Yankee, Heber C. Kimball, since deceased, a saint of high degree and a mighty man of commerce. We saw the tithing house and the, li and the lion house and I do not know or remember how many more church and government buildings of various kinds and curious names. We flitted hither and thither and, and enjoyed every hour and picked up a great deal of useful information and entertaining nonsense and went to bed at night satisfying. satisfied. The second day we made the acquaintance of Mr. Street, since deceased, and put on white shirts and went and paid a state visit to the king. He seemed a quiet, kindly, easy-mannered, dignified, self-possessed old gentleman of 55 or 60 and had a gentle craft in his eyes 
in his eye that probably belonged there. He was very simply dressed and was just taking off a straw hat as we entered. He talked about Utah and the Indians and Nevada and general American matters and questions with our secretary and certain government officials who came with us. But he never paid any attention to me, notwithstanding I made several attempts to draw him out on federal politics and his high-handed attitude toward Congress. I thought some of the things I said were rather fine, but he merely looked around at me at, distinct, at distant intervals, something as I have seen a benign old cat, a benign, <laughs> yeah, old cat look around to see which kitten was meddling with her tail. By and by I subsided into an indulgent silence, and so sat until the end, hot and flushed, and execrating him in my heart for an ignorant savage. But he was calm. His conversation with those gentlemen flowed on as sweetly and peacefully and musically as any summer brook. When the audience was ended and we were retiring from the presence, he put his hand on my head, being down on me in an in an admiring way and said to my brother, Ah, your child, I presume? Boy or girl? <laughs> Salt Lake City, hey, dig that tabernacle Daddy, choir. Could you, could you get, Salt Lake you City, pen, hey, they'd be bound to take you higher. And you know them crazy I'm Mormon chicks. I'm getting marked the one Well, one. they I'm really like my fire. Salt Lake City. Brigham turn the desert blue. Salt Lake City. Put a color TV in every room. And you know Salt Lake City. I'll be going there real soon. And when I do, I'll only be drinking Mountain Ten. There's one daily double in this round of play in one of these categories. Germany. Books. Maiden names. Sports. And finally, antonyms, opposites. Bob, you go first. You're the champ. I'll take sports for a hundred dollars. The first clue is nickname of dragster Don Garlitz. Okay, who is Big Daddy? Not fast Big enough. Daddy, Bob's Don like Garlitz. Again, let's try sports for Rick Rush. In 1916, Georgia Tech beat Cumberland College 222 to nothing in this sport. Maureen. What is the Bob?